for SCP-666, Object Class Euclid, Special Containment Procedures. SCP-666 to be stored in a monitored closed vault at all times at Site-73 in the Tibetan Mountains. Guards are to be changed weekly and must pass a background check before being assigned to their post, and proven free of drug and alcohol addiction. SCP-666 is only to be entered by D-Class personnel and approved testing procedures, or approved Foundation researchers with Level 4 or higher security clearance. Non-D-Class personnel who enter SCP-666, whether or not they have revealed a prior history of addiction, must be observed by a guard at all times. If they show any sign of being affected by SCP-666, they are to be removed immediately. SCP-666 is a medium-sized Tibetan yurt made of tied wooden branches and covered in yak leather. The interior ceiling is 8 foot high and the base of the yurt is 30 feet. The hut is circular in shape. The interior of the yurt appears to be as crude as the outside to the majority of observers, with a dirt floor. The branches that make up the yurt frame are wrapped in rabbit fur and tied with yak leather thongs. Periodically, SCP-666 will change its location within the confinement area. This will only happen when not under direct observation, but remote viewing gives the impression of an entity inside the structure lifting it wholly and moving it to its new position. To date, it has not made any attempt to escape confinement. SCP-666 was discovered in 1973 by SCP operatives searching the mountain regions on reports of several missing persons having returned from the area giving similar explanations, seeking shelter during harsh weather. The individuals who would happen upon SCP-666 by seemingly happenstance. Having gone out in similar conditions, the exploration team also were able to discover the yurt. Of the three operatives present, two experienced no ill effects. The third entered a stupor, experiencing vivid hallucinations and muttering incoherently to himself. Upon retrieval of the team, the yurt was recovered and taken to nearby Site-73 for further investigation. When an individual with no history of significant addictions enter the yurt, the yurt remains dormant and seems to have no ill effects. Class D personnel without a history of alcohol or narcotics abuse were able to sit inside the yurt for days at a time and provided proper nourishment, but did report a greater intensity in their dreams. Individuals who have a history of substance abuse, however, will experience a hallucinogenic effect when inside the structure. In all instances, the subjects report being in a location either from their memories or a corollary thereof, specifically a spot where their addiction was at its most intense. Thus far, there have been reports of a nightclub bathroom, a 1973 Volkswagen Vanagon, a filthy alleyway, the <laughs> casino in Las Vegas, etc. One subject reported finding himself in a dirty apartment with a prostitute named Chloe with whom he frequently indulged in narcotics abuse, another reported being in his own bedroom with a computer setup significantly more intricate than he owned before his arrest for distribution of child pornography. During these hallucinations, subjects report that they are confronted by an individual referred to as SCP-666-1. Descriptions of SCP-666-1 vary wildly from person to person, with no commonality to race gender or appearance beyond being typical for the surroundings. SCP-666-1 will indulge a subject in their personal addictions, although at the start they will have a passive-aggressive attitude. As time progresses, the subject is encouraged to indulge further while simultaneously being encouraged to stop. Should the subject show remorse or a strong desire to give up their addiction, SCP-666-1 will solely adopt a more genuinely friendly tone and continue the temptation with discouragement hallucinations. Approximately 94% of subjects who have gone through this form of hallucination to their end have been diagnosed as near-complete removal of psychological addictions, though physical temptations will persist through a natural withdrawal cycle. If the subject gives in to SCP-666-1's temptations, the entity becomes increasingly hostile. There is no set timetable nor degree of indulgence, but if left unchecked, SCP-666-1 will invariably begin assaulting the subject and forcing their vice upon them to levels of extreme overdose. If the subject is not forcibly removed from SCP-666, during this period they will die. The cause of death is typical of their addiction 
where an alcoholic will suffer extreme kidney or liver failure, a cocaine user will develop cardiac dysrhythmia, a subject addicted to video games or television will suffer extreme muscle atrophy and health issues associated with a sedentary lifestyle, etc. To date, there has been no clear connection between who will and will not succumb to SCP-666-1. The working hypothesis is that it is simply a matter of the individual's willpower and conviction. All attempts to directly interview SCP-666-1 has failed, with the entity either redirecting the conversation or bluntly refusing to answer. The only statement that reveals anything to his nature was a single instance of, we're not important here, this is all about you. This indicates that there are either multiple entities attached to SCP-666, or there are additional instances of SCP-666 in the world. Investigation is ongoing and whether similar stories arise, should another instance of SCP-666 be discovered, it is to be transferred immediately to Site-73. Addendum SCP-666-1 Nearly identical stories have recently arisen in remote areas of northern Canada describing a Wendigo hut. While unconfirmed, their similarities point to at least one additional instance of SCP-666 at large. Addendum SCP-666-2 Interview log with test subject D-14390 regarding experiences in SCP-666. Audio only. Interview 666-13 Interviewer Dr. Lannis Interview subject D-14390 Date April 17th Subject D-14390, how are you feeling? Eh, not bad, Doc, not bad. Kinda wanna take another nap in the tent. Well, that's what we're here to talk about. Please describe your experience inside of SCP-666. Heh, <laughs> no sweat there, Doc. See, I just stroll in, like you said, have myself a seat, next thing I know I'm in this hole in the wall back home and… What this sweet bitch Chloe? Chloe? Oh yeah, she was pricey and she wasn't the best looking trick south of Kennedy, but she had some connections. Never did meet up with her ones that we weren't getting high. Note, Chloe was the working name of the prostitute that D-14390 was with at the time of his arrest. Very well. Please describe the scenario for me. Well, it was her apartment, right? Kinda dingy, a little messy like she hadn't cleaned it in a couple weeks. But I wasn't there for the scenery, you know. So I dropped my cash off on the living room table and we headed to the bedroom. I shoot up with her, use my own needle of course, and then we get freaky. I mean, we did everything under the sun in a couple that never saw the light of day. She knew positions I never did and had drugs I hadn't even heard of. About halfway through I needed a pick-me-up so I snorted a couple lines of Columbian off her ass and… I think that's enough, D-14390. For the sake of brevity, please keep the rest of your testimony in regards to the anomalous entity SCP-666-1. The what now? The person who tempted you into your hallucination. Oh, right. Well, it was about the time that she was offering me this opium shit she said she got off of a Chinaman. The whole time she'd been saying stuff in kind of funny way like those, uh, whatcha call -ems. Uh, backface comments. A backhanded compliment. Yeah, that's the stuff. Well, I started taking a couple of pulls off the opium and I'm feeling mellow, but she just kept glaring at me, right? So I ask what's up and she hauls off and punches me in the face. Not like this fragile little crack whore would either. I mean, I thought I was gonna going 10 with Tyson right about now. She starts screaming at me, calling me weak, saying I'm pathetic, just giving in, you know? Bitch shit. So I kick her in the chest and that's when shit got weird. Next I know, she's got me on the ground her arms are around my throat. Her eyes get huge and bloodshot and shit. I feel her nails digging into the sides of my neck. And hand to God, Doc, she was shooting shit into me. You're saying SCP-666-1 was injecting you with heroin through her nails? Not sure what it was, but it burned and felt good at the same time. And they weren't nails no more, it was like big like big cat claws, right? And she's still yelling at me, but her mouth is getting bigger and bigger like her jaw stretching out, and her teeth keep getting sharper and bigger like she's ready to eat my head. Even as blasted as I was, that was some freaky shit, and I started screaming. And that was when the guards pulled you out of the tent, right? Yeah, seems I wasn't just freaking out in a dream, weird shit was about, like, 
five seconds after I got pulled out. I hear Chloe's voice again, but it's all low and growly and sounded like she said, You can't stop. Thank you, D-14390. I just have one last question for you. After all this, you said you wanted to go back in. Why? Well, it's simple, right? <laughs> she was scary and all, but man, I've never been that high in my life, and with the shit that goes on in this place, I figured I'm not long for the world anyways, so I might as well go out with a smile, right? Note, following the interview, D-14390 repeatedly volunteered for additional testing with SCP-666. Dr. Lannis finally relented. D-14390 began screaming approximately three seconds after entering the hallucinatory state, and expired from cardiac arrest less than one minute later.